one of the challenges that faces our world is how we talk about the culture war or what a culture war might look like. And too often, it resembles people who have no understanding of warfare itself, no perception of goals or strategic value or making a direction, a movement, a raid, and, or, or so forth. It seems like them trying to gin up interest, motivation, trying to produce false senses of urgency to talk about a political change or a cultural institution or something of that sort. <clears throat> and one of the ways that we see this happen most often on the cultural level is the, the phrase fifth generation warfare. So it's not we're not going to necessarily get into ex describing what fifth generation warfare is or may be, because in some semblance, the definition itself is an attempt to deny its own existence. But there's and there are books that can be read about it. Rather, what's more important today is for us to talk about a very specific problem that has to do with identifying a culture as an attack vector in a use of war. Now, we've been talking quite a bit about the difference between von Clausewitz and Mao. And the difference between von Clausewitz and Mao can be understood as the one perceived warfare as a form of violence and use of force between nation states, where the other one saw culture as an attack vector by which change can be instituted in a society. Warfare, in a von Clausewitz sense, has a beginning and an end. And it, you can see baked into this worldview a desire to see things as happening, what led to something happening, it actually taking occurrence, and then being final. We won the war is an idea that something in the past happened, had an ending, and there was a conclusion, a Treaty of Versailles, or a, um, you know, a conquering, where the North conquered the South in the American Civil War. Whereas the culture view, the Maoist view of warfare, is something much more invasive because it is, in its own sense, continued simply by its own spirit. The difference between a von Clausewitz-style victory, which would be where your army meets my army and my army is victorious, subjugating you to my will, and a Maoist victory where... I have captured your institutions and have changed your inst your society to value my things is that they are not one for one compatible. The left in American politics wages a culture war where the right still technically perceives it as a institutional victory, something like elections alone. So what it, what is an example of this? You have universal support of an organization like Black Lives Matter or a cultural expectation within the left to say that Antifa is an idea, not an institution, or Antifa is an idea, not an organization. This is, the, this is them confessing their worldview to you, that their idea is so real to them that it doesn't even need organization to exist, whereas the right is looking for things like CPAC or Donald Trump in a personality, or they're looking for people to become a solution. So uh, they're, they're looking for the mechanism of government to, imp to create the outcome, the mechanism of a culture. It's not even that way, but the mechanism of a government, let's just say. And so the why those two things do not cross lines very well, even though they're in conflict, is that the right is unwillingly, perhaps, in a cultural conflict with the left, whereas the left is very willingly in a cultural and political conflict against the right. So the challenge that we're going to talk about today is when we start to consider culture as a legitimate attack vector and a use of war. What happens when the phrase culture war is not addressed from the position of, say, a pundit or somebody on the social media like this trying to make money catching your attention, but rather when we address it from the position of a general, a soldier, a military individual who has a distinct goal in mind. Maybe it's winning a battle, winning a war, 
or dis destroying a supply line or instituting some sort of control in the region. What happens when it's not the pundits talking about culture war, but the combatants? Now, we've talked about warfare in a different, or we've talked about a number of subjects recently, particularly the difference between politics, economics, and culture. And culture is going to have to distinguish itself from, again, something else today. But to wrap that up, to, to kind of bring that together, politics has to do with law and governance. Economics has to do with markets and money. And culture has to do with norms and, to some extent, described religions, belief systems. The difference between culture and philosophy is culture might be the description of a people's norms, the things that they do regularly, their patterns of life on a meta scale, whereas philosophy should be the exploration of the foundations of those beliefs. And this is why you'll have political philosophy, economic philosophy, and then you'll have what would be referred to as cultural philosophy, but it's it's a little bit, it, it kind of gets a little redundant at that time. And these three things interact with each other, politics, economics, and culture, because from a political point of view, you will see um, a uh, politics has an influence over what is considered a black market and what is considered a white market, and then the gray markets. So politics affects e economics by having some sort of legal claim to what is what can and cannot be sold and it has an impact on economics through black and white markets if a company if i'm sorry if a government bans a thing that's economically uh profitable to a, a people like let's just say an illicit drug or a firearm then that that item even that item that has cultural support maybe will continue to be sold whether or not it persists so anything that, that we're gonna we're gonna build a triangle real quick right here we've got politics economics and culture politics impacts economics by having some say over what is a black and a white market politics has an influence over culture as well by enforcing certain cultural norms this is the the, the idea of like what is considered murder or where does it it, it might it, it might impact a cultural norm by banning a certain religion it may encourage that religion by banning it and through martyrdom but we're kind of getting too detailed there economics will impact politics and culture as well economics impacts politics by funding it you, this might be through donations or, or kingmakers. It might be how money influences power. Uh, and then it also might be, in, you can see how economics changes politics because economic conditions produce the means by which people will engage in their political system. But economics also is an impact on culture itself because the things that markets value have an influence over culture if things it, it, whether it's made available or whether it's what is being produced that will have an impact on culture because and, and we're going to see how these three things are actually quite cyclical um, but then culture itself has an impact on politics because the beliefs that are held by a people are oftentimes reflected in their political system this is where the phrase a government of by and for the people is more prescriptive than it is descriptive the american government is not supposed to be one that is described as, not not is not only one that it should be described as of for and by the people but it in fact must be because there can be no government that exists without the will of the governed it's not that it is a should or shouldn't it is a it, that was a definitive statement no government exists without the part the um the what do you call it no government can exist without the either uh in the willing voluntary support of the people or the coerced support of the people and so culture impacts politics that way and culture impacts economics because people spend money on things that they value they affect the markets through boycotts they affect the markets through 
uh, financial support. And so you see how these three things are not only cyclically involved with one another, but they are three pieces of the same coin, politics, economics, and culture. And so as we start looking at these three things, these politics, economics, and culture as three distinct components of what we understand within a warlike framework, we're going to zero in on the cultural sense because it's really easy to define war on a political scale, especially when one government declares war on another or a government employs individuals to sabotage and destroy another government. It becomes a little bit more vague when we look at economics because a government can do sanctions. They can do embargoes. We can have these issues where a government like the United States will issue an embargo over a country like Cuba until they relinquish relationships with another country. Is that considered warfare? In a, in a phrase, technically yes, because a state is using a form of coercion that isn't direct military force, by the way, but it is sort of enforced by that. It, but a, a, a government will use coercion to institute a change in another. So we distinguish that from warfare by calling it economic warfare. Another version of economic warfare that we've talked about a couple of times is when a government uses an like a trade system, a market to harm harm another one. So we've talked about it maybe in sanctions or something like the opium trade. But the hardest one to nail down, and I think this is where we are at today as a society, is what does it look like when we talk about a cultural warfare or a cultural war or cultural warfare? Because on the one hand, we all feel it. It's right in front of us all the time. We see the flags and the ceremonies and the, the events where people are making declarations of their values in public, but then those values are not equally distributed amongst the people they claim to be equally distributing to. Something like, it's, it's, it's not surprising to see that the equity movement specifically targets certain people to harm them. Or if... Uh, the, you saw we saw this in Minneapolis during the riots, where people would paint certain things, cultural icons, cultural things on their buildings, sort of like taking the blood of the lamb and putting it over the doorpost, hoping that the protesters would leave them alone. Regardless of whether or not they believed it, they were bullied into compliance to a cultural ideology through a form of street violence that was culturally condoned, by the way, um, on a massive scale. So the issue with culture as an attack vector for warfare against a peoples or against a nation falls on a few dividing lines. If the definition or argument gives too much, is given too much space, if it is too broad, because you, you, you hear this language, I'm, I'm reading a little bit from some writing I was doing earlier, but if, if you look at, here's a kind of a useful tool for language in, in regards to philosophy, sometimes they'll refer to things as a broad or narrow definition. And what they're saying, what we're talking about when we say those two things is, is just quite literally, there are a diff couple of different ways where this word and this use is interpreted. And we might be trying to figure out what is the proper limits between too broad and too narrow, because it's not always an easy like pinpoint line the definition of a thing or the use and application of a thing isn't always so easy that it becomes that specific. Sometimes it's kind of within a range. And a cultural using culture as an attack vector as a concept is certainly one of those things. And as individuals in a society, if we are going to claim to be a decentralized people, then we are accepting with that the de facto responsibility that it is our or that it or that the 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 fact that it is our individual responsibility to engage in these concepts so once again it re returns to some of the values of early america that it's going to be a republic if you can keep it is an argument on whether or not we are being diligent and while i understand the motivation that many people put behind it it is more often used as a virtue signal than an honest truth so what are the values of the Republic or do we even honor them anymore is not something that is easy to reflect on ourselves. Rather, it's easy to project on other people, which is not which is what we want to move away from. So let's talk about defining culture as an attack vector for a, in, in a warlike pattern. We don't 
from where I'm at in my studies and where I'm at in my in this engagement, it's it, it can still be difficult to narrow down exactly what it is. Now, there are some examples that really stand out. But the, the challenge that we're looking at, what we're kind of doing is we're taking a broad a, a, this scale of definition from either too narrow to too broad and we're tightening it down into something that fits correctly. And we're going to start by addressing what does too broad look like and what does too narrow look like. But if if we and so if we are if we paint too broadly with what we condemn or consider a a method of warfare that culture is an attack vector for warfare, what we're going to inevitably do is we are going to start what we're going to end up if we what we're going to end up doing is that we're going to see um, we're going to end up kind of grabbing people who are not participating in that activity and them getting they will be paying the consequence for it that is a horrible way of saying if we paint too broadly with this issue we turn innocent victim innocent people into victims if we if we if we paint it too narrowly then malicious actors get away with their debauchery so too broadly speaking in 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 reference in, re, in reference to the culture war if we paint too broadly, what ends up happening is anybody who is engaging in evangelism, proselytizing, or even education can rightfully or can be can be described or will be subject to be considered a culture war participant. Or not a culture war participant, but a person engaging in warfare using culture as an attack vector. So if America sends, say, um, not just a diplomat, but like a missionary to go build a well how is that not perceived as something like warfare because they'll call it colonization or, or, or whatever if a if you see teachers education academics coming from one country to another to engage with fellow academics and engage in honest scholarship on a subject then if your definition of culture war is too broad they will be wrapped up into the they will be wrapped up and accused, or they will be—they will end up subject to being considered uh, combatants in a culture war. But if your description is too narrow, and so I got—I'm going to read this one because it's a little bit easier to do just from notes. Um, if the definition or argument gives too much space, if it is too broad, proselytizing or evangelism or even religion it is it, it as a whole may be identified as an act of war and you see this in in certain countries where they ban things like christianity where they ban they they violently attack things you might even call some of the middle east conflicts and having an issue with this broadness be it cultural spread or infusion or assimilation to capture um these all things, assimilation alone can be seen as an act of war. You see a reference to this almost in kind of like Ibram X. Kendi's book, where the only religion that's acceptable in the society is whatever he refers to as anti-racism, uh, which is interesting because he's kind of asking for tithes in the book too. But so be it cultural, be it, so, that, so that's the one side. We have this broad definition of culture war and then on the opposite side we have a narrow definition which would be if the definition is too narrow the use of propaganda or organizations which deliberately subject a society to ills or to subvert its people and capitalize on their malcontent these are allowed to run free so in our in the world that we live in if we paint too broadly, if we 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 with if everything is considered a culture war and everything is considered um, uh, if, if we are too broad with how we define this idea of using culture as a, as a, as an attack vector for warfare, then even the concept of religion itself ends up as a casualty on the battlefield or sus suspect. And you start marching ever closer to that sort of communism or that historical action that has, we've seen take place over and over again where all that it is need to put somebody to death is to be accused of being a statist or a rightist or a fascist or a communist or a whatever it is, right? So if, the, if the, the, the terms to define culture war are too broad, then you create not even a genocide, and I'm sorry, not a genocide or a, um, a jihad or a crusade of sorts, you create um, a democide. You're just killing off the, all the people who you don't like, effectively, or believe things that you don't like. 
uh, and it becomes it, be, it comes down to the structural level of an idea, and it essentially turns the government itself into a religion or whatever it is, the apparatus of the state, and then you get multitudes of problems. Millions, if not billions, of lives can be lost this way very quickly. So, but on the other side, and the other side that we're dealing with is a culture that is so loose. The de I'm sorry, the the definition, of the 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 the, the requirements for an, a, a, a thing to be defined as a cultural warfare, as cultural warfare to be so narrow, if that, is, if that definition is too narrow, then what it does is it leaves, it allows bad actors to get away with bad action. Um, and so what that looks like is where you can have an institution in a city that the sole purpose of that institution is uh, it, you can have a foreign funded institution within a city call it a church or whatever um a, a, that is funded by a foreign government and their sole purpose is to sow dissent in the population and so you create this apparatus that is oftentimes used by forms of terror what we would call terrorism i guess and again we'll refer to jamil Giovanni's book why young men at how you have this issue where people build on or where you have this issue where the narrowness of the definition for culture war allows for bad actors to make do with what they have. So what does this mean for us? And what does this mean for us as individuals? What does this mean for America as a whole? What does this mean for the philosopher or the father or the family man? What this means is that Yes, in a sense, you are in a culture war, that there are people who are vying for your mind as the battle space of their conflict. There are people who are doing this wittingly. There are people who are engaging in this for the malicious intent of propaganda. And it is our, in our responsibility as rational people to be able to sort through what is meaningful information and what is not meaningful information what is good for me and what is something that i am able to engage in and what is particularly used to distract disorient or destroy my society i think it was um it was uh, like i think it was tim pool who brought this up on one of his episodes because he's got a million of them and so that's not worth tracking down which one where he said the when you get those robo calls on your phone um, you know that you get a you get a spam call on your phone and and it doesn't do anything it's not even trying to get a hold of your information it's just wasting your time for the individual it doesn't have much of an impact but if i but if that for a very small amount of resources i can destroy 4 million man hours of productivity in a foreign country one might consider that a form of economic warfare so then, of course, why don't they? Why don't these calls come in at like two o'clock in the morning or four in the or, you know at any time? They always come in when you're at work hours or something like that. Um, so what happens then if you do that with a culture that you create multiple? You use a you use a pseudo religion to institute multiple little ideologies across the society that each one of them creates a problem and they disrupt the flow of the society, harboring or um, or preying on maybe even legitimate grievances, not for the intent of solving them, but for the in intent of creating a problem out of them. Once again, a really good example would be the sort of anti-racist movement. They, were not, they had no intention in solving the problem. They just wanted you to always pay attention to them. Ibram X. Kendi says so in his book. And so the, this whole anti-racist movement thing was, is that considered a form of cultural warfare? I mean, we might say on the one hand, yes, because it's impacting the culture that we engage in. But if we attach the word warfare to that as a descriptor, aren't we adding a certain amount of weight to it that needs to be concerned with? Like, you can't just call something a war and then do nothing about it. I mean, that's, that's it's antithetical to the urgency of the moment. And so what we deal with as men and how we make a solution to this, because we've talked about a number of things here and just to kind of recap, politics affects economy, uh, economy affects culture, culture affects politics, politics affects culture, culture affects economy, economy affects politics. These things, what we are recognizing is that the way that we look at culture is what's in question. Now, this is the redacted culture cast, but we, or we are engaging it from a philosophical level. Culture is not so simply 
or how do we think about culture? Is is culture something that we simply describe, or is it something that we live? Well, for it use for use in academic terms, we we only use culture as a descriptor. I describe that culture, but for ourselves, for us as individuals, we are not disembodied spirits that specifically amalgamate these things and then put them together. Rather, we have to choose how to live those out. We need to choose where we put our time, where we put our energy, where we put our money, and where do we put our work. And through those things, through the investigation of our values and the things that we believe to be right and true and good, not only do we accomplish the fact that if not only do we accomplish the introspection that's needed, what are my values and how am I living them? But we also build a robust society or we build a society that is robust against a culture vector of att a culture as an attack vector. And this is one of the di major many dangers that I would describe that I think multiculturalism has done to the world. Specifically, this idea that multiculturalism assumes at itself as a method of producing something like world peace. That assumption is the bait. It's not the hook. It's the bait. So it assumes we can just get along because you believe what you want to believe and I believe what I want to believe. But what the hook that comes in multiculturalism, it tends, turns out to be, is a cudgel of the state. Somebody is determining which cultures fit within the multicultural environment. And I'm going to give you a tip. It sure as hell ain't you. And so when you see the high priests of multiculturalism and the proselytizing happening in the world, what you're seeing is an issue of not exactly a culture war per se, but somebody enforcing their culture upon you. And then what that does for us is when we see force, we are we we meet it with right force. If you're going to see people proselytizing to you about what your cultural expectations are, then if we want to consider that in a frame of self-defense, you have a right to understand, pursue, and explain, if not drive, your own culture forward. And we cannot help but exist in one. We cannot ex help but participate in one. And so as much as this episode was a little bit more ambig ambiguous, and mind you, it was sort of recorded at the end of a long day, the purpose, the thing that I want to en encourage that is happening within our community and within our gun culture and our society and in, in our America is that uh, no, people are not going to wake up. That is not something that happens. That is a pipe dream that is a, a fake it, it's a this idea that people need to wake up and the way that it's talked about is really, we need to move on from that, especially from a strategy, because let's be honest, it's not only is it not going to happen, but it doesn't mean anything. It's 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 just jargon. What we do do, what it, what is the imperative, what we are compelled to do as individuals of the United States is identify our values and expect them in our societies. We are to expect them in people around us. And if we are not willing to even do that, then your fa your values are just fashion statements. So that in being the case, in the idea of the cultural warfare, if we are going to see things as a cultural, a, a, a culture, I'm sorry, if we're going to see culture as a legitimate attack vector, then what we need to be able to also do is not simply identify potential threats by their capability, but also by their intent. And that is the responsibility of the individual in a decentralized world. So if this has been beneficial to you, thank you very much for listening along. This has been the Redacted Culture Cast, episode 163, Problems with Culture as Warfare. If you want to support the channel, you can head over to redactedculture.l or I'm sorry, redactedculture.locals.com. Jeez, I get that wrong every time. redactedculture.locals.com. Or you can support us through Redacted LLC, where you get some of the goofy things that we work on all the time. That being the case, Christmas is upon us, and you will see more from us soon. That being the case, go forth and conquer.